Hi, everybody. Here's today's announcements. In no particular order. It was kind of stream of consciousness here, so not really well planned out. Not very orderly, but it is what it is. Okay, so first of all, again, a reminder that this weekend is your midterm, and it is open book. So uh, what that means is you can use all of your class resources. You can use downloaded PowerPoints. You can use your textbook, whatever helps you to get through it. Okay, <clears throat> open book midterm exam. It's online. It's on Brightspace, and you know how to get to it. Then the next thing is, uh, the last time we met, there were these five-minute videos, and I was really enjoying the audio in those videos. And I realized none of you were because I went back and I lit and I watched the uh, the video. I downloaded it, and uh, it turns out that you didn't get any of the audio. So um, if you want to uh, download the PowerPoint, it's posted. The links are there, and you can follow the links and actually get those one minute videos with the audio. My apologies there. I forgot that when I've got my headset plugged in, uh, for some reason it doesn't um, pass along the audio, so to speak. So again, my apologies, And uh, but you have the links, they're in the PowerPoint, and you can follow those and watch them. It'll take you a total of about five and a half minutes to watch them, okay? <laughs> you can watch them over and over again. Now, um, in both of the theory classes, people are asking me about codes and how do I get the codes and how do I download them from the library and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I see you tomorrow for lab. If you bring in your laptops tomorrow, um, because I think that you have to actually be on the college uh, system for the system to recognize that you're at SAIT. Okay, so you have to be on the SAIT wireless. So bring your laptops uh, to lab, and uh, and I'll show you all how to download the ASME codes uh, from the Reg Earhart Library. If you want, not compulsory. And then as for today, what are we going to do? We're going to uh, get back onto traps, uh, their operation, their application, sizing, uh, limitations that kind of thing because really traps are kind of fascinating and one of the problems that exists in the power engineering uh, curriculum at the third class level they really don't get much in theory of operation and uh, if you understand the theory of operation then you're better able to assess and troubleshoot what's going on with a particular uh, trap because traps frankly are troublesome for us uh, when they're passing steam, they're wasting a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, when they uh, aren't passing condensate, uh, we've got all kinds of operational problems, including water hammer or uh, heat exchangers that aren't working correctly. So um, they occupy a lot of our time, uh, testing, monitoring, all that kind of stuff. So it's very uh, good to understand the principles of operation uh, with these traps. And that's our day. So let's go on to our PowerPoint. Our dreaded PowerPoint. Yeah, okay, there. And then where do we leave off? We left off. Uh, over here. <clears throat> so three basic principles of operation, again, thermostatic, mechanical, and thermodynamic. And what I said was a little bit different is uh, this term in terms of sensitivity. What are these things detecting? Where's my menu? Didn't want to do that. I want my menu because I want to turn this into a pen. And it just isn't doing that, is it? 
Oh, now look at that. They kicked me out. That's weird. Aha, now I have a menu, and now I can select the pen. Okay, so a thermostatic uh, trap. It's easy to see mechanical ones. Mechanical ones, we've got a density difference, and we know that condensate is the density of water, whatever it is at that particular temperature, and we know that steam is not very dense. It's gas versus liquid, and so we have a float, something that responds to the density difference. Uh, the thermodynamic one is kind of interesting because it's uh, sensitive to the temperature difference between in steam and condensate. And so let's say that we've got steam that's at a saturation temperature of 150 degrees Celsius in a high pressure steam line. And it condense. Well, what is the temperature of the condensate produced? 150 degrees Celsius. But wait a minute, Dave, you said sensitive to the temperature difference, and I don't see a temperature difference there at all. The steam and the condensate that produced as that steam condenses, they're both going to be at saturation temperature. So what happens is we have to wait for that condensate to subcool by a certain number of degrees. So let's say it has to subcool to 130 degrees Celsius. There's our temperature difference. Okay, so what we have then is a trap mechanism that knows that the steam is 150 and is going to cool off the condensate to 130 before it opens. So now that comes into play when we start looking at these uh, different types of uh, traps. And I'm not going to go over this. This is just a simple radiator trap. Uh, but what I do want to mention is anything that has a bellows in it is going to be sensitive to water hammer. And this is one of the things that keeps coming up is in terms of application. Um, So if we want to have a type of trap that is not sensitive to water hammer, wouldn't, wouldn't be damaged, we'd think of something like an inverted bucket trap or we think of a bimetal trap where there's nothing to crush. But if you've got a bellows, water hammer can crush the bellows. Or if you've got a float, water hammer can crush the float. Now, these can fail open or shut, and it really depends upon the type of uh, uh, bellows mechanisms and so we would specify we would specify when we're ordering the thing like we'd go over the spec sheet and say oh we need a new steam trap and I'd go over from Exarco or Armstrong or whoever this company is and I would want to know if this particular thing is going to fail open or shut because you can order them um, in both uh, variations so if you get a question that says, you know, these things always fail shut or always fail open, well, the key word there is always, which means uh, <clears throat> kind of bad news, right? <laughs> always means always. Um, okay, uh, here's the valve mechanism. So some of the things on this particular uh, type of dealy is let's say you need to service it. Maybe the thing isn't working. One of the first things you look at, of course, is the bellows. Well, what you can do is unscrew this bonnet and pull out the bellows mechanism and damage, uh, check it for damage, and you can usually reorder uh, the part. But, of course, you'd have to specify whether it fails open or shut. And then another thing here is the seat. And, you know, maybe the seat gets worn out. Maybe it's wire drawn or something like that. So the seats are usually replaceable as well. Uh, but a lot of times these traps are kind of like um, disposable because they're fairly small and inexpensive. So if the whole trap costs you 300 bucks, you know, um, and if you need a new bellows and the bellows cost you 100 and you need a new seat that costs you 50 bucks, 
and you're going to spend 200 bucks just rebuilding it plus the cost of your labor, a lot of times it's just like, ah, throw the thing out. Now, another thing is we look at orientation of the trap. And this one here, the outlet is at the bottom. And um, so what we're thinking of is, does the trap uh, have sort of a self-cleaning property? Because sometimes we get debris, we get some scale, we get some rust products that get carried through uh, from the heat exchanger or through the piping system. And they can build up here. And if that crap builds up on the seat, does it plug up the orifice or does it tend to get swept away with the condensate? And so then this type of trap here is considered to be pretty good in terms of, of, of clogging um, because um, of the position of the outlet. We wouldn't put it upside down because then the thing would fill up with crud. Uh, so anyway, there's our thermostatic uh, bellows trap. Um, yeah, so this is what the word I was looking for, self-draining uh, when the outlet is down. Uh, sensitive to water hammer. And another thing is anything with a bellows is going to be uh, sensitive to superheated steam. So if superheated steam gets in there, it'll probably cause it to overexpand and, uh, and get damaged. Now the liquid expansion trap, this one's new for you folks. And what we have is a bellows, yes, so of course it's sensitive to, um, to superheated steam, it's sensitive to water hammer, okay, fine. But inside the bellows is a non-volatile liquid. As a matter of fact, it's gonna be an oil. There's an oil in there. And that oil is going to expand and contract, depends upon uh, the temperature of the condensate. Now, down here at this end, there is um, uh, an adjustment nut, so you can actually adjust at what temperature this thing discharges condensate. So the condensate that comes out of there could be anywhere between 60 to 100 degrees Celsius. And that's, uh, that's what I got from the Spirac Sarco website. Okay, 60 to 100 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> So, here's what happens. Condensate comes in, and it's hot. Maybe it's 150 degrees Celsius. And that hot condensate flows in, and when the hot condensate surrounds that, it heats it up, and it closes until the condensate drops to 60 to 100 degrees Celsius. So, that's the subcooling. And that can be a bit of a problem. Let's say in our steam system, the saturation temperature is 210 degrees Celsius. So it lets in condensate that's in this case 210. That condensate has got to cool off, you know, 110 degrees Celsius before it actually gets discharged. What that means is the condensate will build up and build up and build up inside of the drip leg, inside of the um, steam pipe, whatever. And it's a real problem. Let's take a look at a little graph here. And this is from Spirex Sarco. So let's say that we've got a set temperature where that trap opens up. And it's going to be 90 degrees in this example. So I'm going to make a little line here that goes across there. So that's a fixed temperature response line. Now, when the pipe is fairly cold, uh, it's at low temperature and low pressure. And then as we um, warm up the steam line, condensate forms and the pressure uh, rises. And so then this line here is a steam saturation curve. So maybe our normal operating pressure is here. And so let's say maybe that's uh, going to be 100 degrees Celsius at P1. So we've got a fairly small delta T 
a very small amount of subcooling that has to occur before that trap discharges. But maybe if my steam line comes up to pressure and maybe it's 200 degrees Celsius is the saturation temperature at this point. Again, we've got that fixed temperature response line. So in this case, you know, 110 degrees of subcooling has to occur. What that means is condensate is going to back up until it cools off. That's all there is to it, which makes the liquid expansion trap really kind of uh, outdated trap. And fairly limited in its usefulness, but it is still used. And next, we're going to take a look at specific applications for it. So, first of all, let's take a look. Here's a steam main and look at this uh, drip leg. That is a massive drip leg, and it can hold a lot of condensate, first of all. Okay, holds a lot of condensate, which is beautiful. So if I do get some condensate back up, it's not likely to get into the same main. Now, down low, I've got a uh, threadlet fitting and an isolation valve, and there's my liquid expansion steam trap. And what I'm going to use this thing for is during startup, or shut down. So when it's starting up, this pipe is cold and there's going to be lots of condensate forming and the condensate will be about 100 degrees Celsius. And at that 100 degrees Celsius, this trap is going to be open and it'll be discharging condensate with minimal backup. And also the open is going to be discharging air and CO2 that are in the steam main. Now, once this thing is up, temperature so let's say that we've got steam at 200 degrees celsius in here we're going to condensate form the condensate is going to be at 200 degrees celsius and the condensate is going to build up in here in this drip leg and it's going to try and go through that liquid expansion trap during normal operation that trap is closed right because it doesn't want to discharge 200 celsius it wants to discharge, say, 90 degrees Celsius condensate. So there's going to have to be a lot of cooling going on this pipe before this thing opens. Actually, it's incorrect to say it stays closed. It operates infrequently. So it's very good as a startup trap. It's also good for a shutdown trap, you know, when the steam line is taking out of service and it cools off and the condensate cools off, it'll open up and discharge, you know, continuously. So what I'm going to do is at a little bit of a higher elevation, I'm going to have another threadlet fitting and another steam trap that is not a liquid expansion type. So this one here is going to be uh, sized for uh, the normal condensate load. So in normal operations, this one here is doing like pretty much all the work. Um, but on startup and shutdown, this one kicks in. Uh, so when, when we combine the capacity of both traps, uh, we get uh, adequate uh, sizing for a startup load. And we, and we know that the startup load is going to be that much greater than the normal running load because the startup load is the condensate that forms as we're trying to raise the, the pipe up to its normal operating temperature, which is a lot of condensate. That's why when you guys are in the lab, you know, you make sure you open up the trap bypasses. The reason you open up the trap bypasses is to handle the condensate load as the turbine metal is warming up, as the steam line is warming up, okay? 
And then once everything is warmed up at saturation temperature, everything is heat soaked, then we can put, make sure the traps are in service and close the trap bypass. And the traps then can be a little bit smaller if they're sized only for a normal condensate load. So that's the liquid expansion, okay? Key in on the word liquid expansion. What's the expanding liquid? It's oil. It's got a fixed temperature response line. So at higher pressures, it'll back up condensate, uh, which is no good. So because of that, we usually combine it with another trap and use this as a startup or shutdown trap. But now the balanced pressure trap is really the same kind of trap, except instead of it having a regular liquid, it's got a volatile liquid inside of the bellows or the capsule. So there's the capsule. By the way, this one here is not in your pan global. And it's really a glaring omission because this is one of the most important traps in service today. That bellows, uh, that bellows or capsule, there's a couple of different uh, varieties. Some might be a pressure capsule. Some might be um, a bellows. If it's a bellows, it's a little bit more sensitive to water hammer. But if it's a capsule, it's actually fairly insensitive to water hammer. So because it's got a volatile liquid in it, it responds to uh, pressure and temperature. It responds to temperature. So it's a saturation in, in temperature. Uh, here we go. Recall that the um, the uh, liquid trap had a fixed response line, but this balanced pressure type kind of works on the same principle, but because there's a volatile liquid in it, it has got a response line that increases and follows the saturated steam curve. So now at any point, we take a look at how much subcooling is required. And it's always a fairly small amount of subcooling, as opposed to, you know, the other one <laughs> had that enormous amount of subcooling. So this one here does not uh, back up condensate. Although being thermostatic, it's still condensate. Uh, being a thermostatic type of trap, though, it still requires subcooling. In order for it to actually discharge. Uh, operate in any orientation. You don't need to have the uh, discharge to the bottom. You can have discharge up. You can have discharge to the side. If you have a discharge at the bottom, it tends to be self-draining. Simple to maintain, just like that other one. You know, you can pop off the top of it. You can change the guts. You can order a new capsule. You can order a new seat. Uh, if that's what's uh, the matter with it. And here's a little animation that shows you how the thing works. Steam gets in there, it expands and closes off the little ball. It steams in there, expands, closes the ball, shuts it off until the condensate cools off, and then it lets condensate through again. Very, very simple. Now the next uh, is the bimetal, and again, this is thermostatic, so again, this requires subcooling of the condensate. Now, one of the problems uh, with this in the PG text, it says this, something like, um, don't close tight. And uh, the reason it doesn't is because these little bimetals aren't very strong. They're not strong enough to shut this thing uh, tight when it's full of condensate so that they will pass some steam.
And uh, so then you might ask yourself, well, why would I buy one if it doesn't close tight? And because it's got these weak little bimetals in there, and plus it's going to, uh, it requires uh, subcooling. Um, why would I even buy the darn thing? So what I'm going to tell you is that's really not correct. You'll see that by metal traps nowadays are changed considerably. Now what they have are multiple by metal strips to give it adequate range of motion. And so that in fact, it does shut it off tight. Okay. So, so this is, uh, old school, but they make them today, uh, far better. Now, one of the problems is that these have a fixed temperature operation, same like the, uh, okay, there's our saturation curve, same like that liquid expansion. So there's the temperature of operation of that particular trap. And then you take a look and go, son of a gun, look at that. At this particular pressure and temperature, this thing is actually open and it's going to be blowing steam. So you have to get to a particular temperature and pressure before it actually starts to close, you know, and then once it does close, as the steam temperature and pressure increases, once it comes up to normal operating pressure, again, we've got this drastic amount of subcooling that takes place. So we're going to back up condensate again. So there are some uh, variations in these as well. So what we'll do is we'll have a whole stack of these bimetals so that they have, like I said, the range and the power to operate the valve much better, uh, but also we'll have different bimetal compounds. So this might be bimetal compound number one, where you've got metal X and metal Y. And then this one here might be bimetal compound number two, where we've got uh, metals A and B, and each one has got sort of a different characteristic so that now we can take the response curve of that trap and sort of have it in a straight line that way and a straight line that way. And in doing so, we actually have a trap that isn't perfect, but it follows the saturation curve much, much better. Open, closed, open, closed. Uh, so, so this one here is from uh, Spirax, okay? And so here you can see a whole bunch of these uh, bimetal uh, discs. And it probably these two on top here are one particular metal compound. And these three might be another metal compound altogether. Um, Anyway, you get the idea how it works, right? I mean, the bimetals, they, they flex and they cause the stem uh, to move up and down as temperature changes. Now, the nice thing is, uh, you know, very little freeze up damage if it's in a cold area. Uh, they're not susceptible to water hammer. They're not affected by high steam temperature, so they can handle superheated steam. Uh, but they may back up condensate. And so again, they should have a fairly large uh, drip leg. Now the F and T has, and this is what you hear in the field, right? Nobody calls it a float and thermostatic because it takes too long to say it's an F and T trap. So the F and T of course has both thermostatic and float elements. And there's really nothing more that I'm going to say about that uh, because you've seen these things. Uh, they've got particular discharge characteristics. So they tend to, uh, on moderate to high loads, they'll discharge continuously. And on low loads, they tend to be a little bit more intermittent in their operation. They're very good on startup because this thermostatic element has got a fairly big orifice. And uh, so any air and non-condensables that come in get discharged pretty uh, easily. 
Now, sometimes people say that you can look good in, on an outside installation, and uh, I, I think you can um, if you lag it. Okay, if you put a lot of insulation around that thing, it'll retain the heat. Now, it says maybe lag to prevent freezing, and lagging is insulation. Okay, it's an old term, and uh, but when I got into this field, we had tradespeople called laggers. Who are insulate uh, insulators, so we can actually put lagging on this thing or insulation um, to prevent it from freezing. Now notice that thermostatic ones have to dissipate heat. Why? Because they need to subcool the condensate. They got to subcool the condensate. They got to subcool the con. So, so we normally do not put insulation on steam traps, but this one here is not about. Um, is not about temperature. Yes, there's a thermostatic element, but that's just an air vent. It works on a, de a density uh, difference. And because it has a density difference that it functions on, then um, we can insulate it, we can lag it. Now, here's the inverted bucket. And again, nobody in the field is saying inverted bucket it takes too long. They just say IB. So this is an IB trap. And you've seen lots of these uh, around uh, our powerhouse, and you know how they work. So a uh, nice thing is uh, this one here, the float, is not susceptible to water hammer because the pressure on the inside of the float and the pressure on the outside of the float are the same. Uh, so, you know, there's nothing to collapse. There's nothing to get damaged. It's just an inverted bucket with a little hole. Now, because all of the air and non-condensables have to go through that tiny little hole there, um, it's not very good at, at uh, venting air. So this is not a good warm-up trap. If your plant has these things and you're warming up a steam line, you're going to have to make sure the trap bypasses are open. And because they're not very good at warm-up, uh, we normally don't size them for a warm-up load. We'll size them for a normal operating load. Now, okay, so that was mechanical. Okay, blue for mechanical, blue for mechanical. And now we're into green, uh, which would be uh, for therm thermodynamic. And so really what we're talking about here is something that is responsive to the thermodynamic properties of the condensate. So we know what happens when a uh, saturated liquid goes through an orifice and undergoes a temperature, uh, a pressure change, a certain amount flashes. So let's say I got 150 degrees Celsius condensate going in here, uh, going through a strainer and that condensate Okay, here it comes, goes zipping around there. And uh, as it gets hot, okay, as it reaches its saturation temperature, a certain amount of it flashes. So the flashed uh, steam goes behind the disc, and it's also on the other side of the disc, but we're going to compare the size of this opening here to the size of the cap above the disc. So even if we've got the same pressure here, P1, is the same as the pressure on top, P1, because this pressure on top of the disc is acting on a larger surface area, there's a greater downward force. So let's uh, go back to the beginning here. When the condensate is cold, the pressure of the condensate opens up the disc and condensate then discharges out. As the condensate gets hotter and hotter, it starts to make steam bubbles that go on both sides of the disc. Eventually, the steam pushes down on the disc until it radiates heat from the top, 
causing uh, that steam to condense and then it operates again. And this just keeps going on and on and on and on and you just hear this thing going click, click, click on a regular basis. Now one of the lousy things about this trap is it doesn't vent air very well. So the disc, uh, they're going to make certain that it's kind of rough on the bottom. The disc is going to be rough on the bottom so that if air does get in there or non-condensables, it'll still be able to sort of kind of find its way to the discharge uh, ports. It doesn't do a great job, and so um, really it's no good for venting air because it's no good for uh, venting air. This is lousy for startup. So again, we would uh, we would select this for. Um, for running loads and not for startup loads. Doesn't vent air. Yeah, it doesn't vent air and it uh, um, backs up condensate. So, but they're very popular and very common. Uh, very, very simple. All you have is this cap here, and there's your disc. And the underside of the disc, like I said, usually has, uh, oh, here, there's a little groove on it, okay? And that little groove is there to help air get out. Okay. Um, so this part here is called the control chamber, and the control chamber always has to be at the top. Um, it also has to have a pretty good differential pressure, otherwise it just isn't going to work. Then the, here's the other thermodynamic trap. And uh, so what do we got here? It's called an impulse trap. And this is what it looks like. This is the one that I think is in your textbook. This one here is made by Yarway. And this is a pretty good um, uh, look at the little bits and pieces. So we've got a seat over here, a little valve seat. And then we've got this piston. And the piston can move up and down. The piston is also hollow, so uh, there's a... Uh, a hole that goes all the way through it and you can see there's the hole right at the end and on top of this there's a disc that's mounted to that piston the disc goes through a guide chamber and the guide chamber has a taper to it it's got a taper kind of like that so let's see how this thing works So there's the piston with the hole through the middle of it. There's the, uh, the disc at the top of the piston. And there's the tapered guide. So condensate comes in. And when it's relatively cool condensate, uh, some of it goes this way. And it pushes up on that disc. It pushes up on the disc until it lifts the piston up and makes this little annular space all the way around. When it makes the annular space, condensate can go through there. But in lifting up this piston, it's also lifted off of the seat, so the condensate can also go around that way. Okay, so there are two paths for the cool condensate. One is up past the disc, down through the middle of the piston, and out and also around the seat and the piston. So, um, now when the condensate um, gets hot or reaches saturation temperature, some of it passes, or pardon me, some of it flashes right over here. Okay, it's going to turn into bubbles of steam here. And so then that makes sort of this localized high pressure, higher pressure, intermediate pressure, if you will, and it actually 
acts on that piston lip and forces that piston down a little bit and kind of closes off that a little bit. And then as the condensate cools off, the opposite happens. And then you're going to say, wait a minute, Dave, you didn't say anything about it actually shutting off the flow. And one of the problems with this type of uh, trap is that it always passes a little bit of steam. It never shuts off entirely. So, uh, unlike the controlled disc trap, this thing here actually uh, does pass air, which is good. Condensed can get through it. Uh, it's got these little openings, like the one that goes right through the piston, uh, that's sensitive to dirt. So, again, we don't want dirt getting in there, but uh, it's also sensitive to back pressure, and it doesn't shut off tight on low condensate loads. Like, it, it doesn't do that. So, um, but that being said, they're out there. Um, they're still in use. You can still buy them. Uh, this one here is made by Yarway. So there's the big overview of the traps. So now selecting. Mentioned a few of these things. Uh, startup load. Do we want to size by a great big honking big trap that will automatically discharge condensate on startup? Or do we want to pay a lot less money for a small trap uh, that is only designed to handle the normal condensate load. Okay, so this is our choice. There is no hard and fast rule. If I'm going to size it for a normal condensate load, then I'll, I will have a plus manual trap bypass valve. But if I'm going to uh, size it for the warm-up load, uh, then I don't need a manual trap bypass. I might want it anyway just for servicing, but uh, this one here will automatically discharge large amounts of uh, condensate. Condensate. Um, steam temperature and pressure. Okay, so for example, all of these steam traps are going to have Canadian registration numbers. And as part of that CRN, you know, there's going to be information about temperature and pressure of the particular trap. We've got to make sure that the trap that we select uh, has a CRN, yes, and it is rated for the temperature and the pressure of the service. Now, pressure differential across the trap, we know that to get a fluid to flow through an orifice, and they all have orifices, um, what we need to have is a delta P across that orifice. And the greater the delta P, the greater the discharge capacity through that orifice. Now, what is if we've got a pressurized uh, a condensate system? Well, then... As if the delta P becomes smaller, uh, then we may need a trap with a larger size orifice, something that is sized correctly to deal with back pressure. Okay, so we might have uh, low pressure condensate. And we might have high pressure condensate. And both of those will affect the delta P and the back pressure across a particular trap. We have to make sure that we select a trap that can deal with the back pressure conditions that we've got. And maybe we've got um, a trap that might be exposed to the outdoors in cold Canada winter. So freeze up may be a concern. So, warm-up load. How then do we determine the warm-up load? Well, there's this really 
crazy formula and it's Q is equal to MC delta T. You may have heard of it before. And in this case, the pipe is steel. And so C is 0 0.494 uh, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Uh, and then we got a particular mass. Well, that would be the mass of the pipe. So we've got a, you know, 100 meters of NPS2 Schedule 40 pipe. Well, how massive is that? Okay. And then we got delta T. So what we have is T1 uh, is ambient temperature. And we've got T2, which is going to be saturation temperature. Oh. How about if I just put that all there? Now, if we want to know how many, um, how much condensate is going to form, we have to divide it by uh, HFG at, uh, at T2. Now, this is not something that you need to write down a formula. Oh, well, remember the formula. No, all you have to do is remember that it's MC delta T, divide that by the saturation um, or the latent heat of evaporation of the steam at T2. Ain't that neat? So here's an example. Oh, and then we can factor in time, okay? So let's say that I do the math and I have to do uh, 150 uh, kilograms of condensate are going to form warming up a particular pipeline. And then I say, well, how fast do I want to warm that thing up? Let's say I want to warm it up in 15 minutes. So that'd be 150 kilograms per 15 minutes. And if I do the math, I'll get kilograms per minute. And then maybe I look at the spec sheet for this particular trap and it's, oh, it's in kilograms per hour. Okay. Well, I know that there are 60 minutes in an hour and the minutes will cancel. And so I'm going to go uh, 150 divided by 15 is very, very close to 10 times uh, 60, which would be equal to 600 uh, kilograms per hour. So then what I do is I look at the uh, spec sheet for all of these different traps by Armstrong or Spirax or whoever. And I go, oh, well, I can pick trap A, B, or C. And oh, this one here is good for 800 kilograms per hour. And this one here is for 600 kilograms, blah, blah, blah. And I probably pick the largest one. So here's an example for you. The question says, what's the warm-up load in kilograms per hour when warming up 30 meters of DN200 SCED40 steel pipe to a working pressure of 1350 kPa over a period of 10 minutes? Uh, the initial temperature of the pipe is 10 degrees Celsius. Well, the condensate load C is going to be equal to MC delta T uh, over L. So now we've got to figure out where that M. We're going to have to go to the pipe tables and figure out what M is. C is going to be equal to 0 0.494 because that's what the specific heat of steel pipe is. Uh, delta T, well, T2 uh, is going to be the saturation temperature at 1350 kPa. So we don't know that. We're going to have to figure that one out too. And T1 will be the initial temperature, which is 10 degrees Celsius. And L, we're going to have to find that. That will be HFG at T2. You know how to do all this stuff? Here's where we get the mass. Okay, the mass from the table, NPS2. Uh, there's our mass uh, in kilograms per meter. 
times however many meters, I think it was 30 meters. And anyway, it's just plug and play from that point on, and we end up with 58.33 kilograms. So to do that warm up in 10 minutes, 58.33 over 10 times 60, I don't like the way the Pan Global lays it out, is 350 kilograms per hour. So, read over your textbook. That's all from your text. Have fun with that. Any questions before we shut her down for the day? Brandon? Do you read this stuff to help you get to sleep at night? Ha! I read it to help me wake up in the morning. <laughs> It gets me pumped up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that note.